Welcome in, Loons fans, to another edition of the Match Day Preview. Jonathan Harrison here, joined alongside Manny Lagos. Manny, how are we doing today? Doing well, thank you very much. Good, good. And because we've been away for two weeks now, and we finally have a game coming up two days from now, we couldn't just do this by ourselves, Manny. No, we had to We had to invite along one of everybody's favorite beat reporters for the club, John Marthaler of the Minnesota Star Tribune. Uh, John, how are we doing today? Not too bad. I thought I was banned from the podcast, so it's great to be back. Who I, told I, you I you were banned I, from the podcast? Nobody told me that. I just assumed I'd earned a ban. So it I'm, was just I'm a glad time to out. be back. It was just yeah. a time. Yeah. yeah. Suspension. Yeah, that's, news. that's news to me. That Yellow card suspension. Effect. <laughs> well, it was Leagues Cup, so it, it feels that's like true. we're kind of used to. Yellow Everybody cards got and suspended. red cards at this point. Well, if you're a Minnesota United player, you got suspended. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, we've got plenty to discuss now coming up. We uh, we have a League's Cup final set after some excellent play last night. We'll get into that. Uh, new U.S. men's national team hiring. I know we got your thoughts on what was the breaking news at the time two weeks ago, Manny. But uh, we can dive into that a little bit here with John. European soccer. Club soccer has started up. Two more signings for the Loons as well. Uh, and we'll preview, obviously, the game coming up on Saturday at Allianz Field against the Seattle Sounders, a tough one for sure. Nine games left in the season, plenty on the line for the Loons. Let's jump into this. Uh, let's jump right into the Minnesota signings, though. Uh, two new signings, Joaquin Perea and Ath- or Anthony Markanich. Manny, your thoughts on the new additions, the final two new additions to the club in that transfer window? Oh, I, I, I obviously, I, I think... Um... The Anthony one is, is is a really good depth piece. It's exciting to kind of find some talent within the league that we're excited about. Uh, but certainly Joaquin Pereira for me is 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 really exciting. Um, in terms of you know we we get a player who likes to break lines with passing. Uh, he's got great vision. You know I, I think outside of Robin Lode we really don't have a guy like him who can. I would say, you know, kind of spring some of the speed we have in the roster, the Sang Ben, the Bongi, the Aboas of the world now. Um, just really excited to uh, add them to the roster. I think, again, it's going to get add another creative piece for solving problems going forward and creating chances. Yeah, I'm excited to see these two guys in action. John, how do we see these guys, all of these additions, uh, over the transfer window, the month-long transfer window? is a busy one for Minnesota United. How do we see these all fitting in over the final nine games of the season here? Well, I think the interesting thing you're about to get into here is that in a, in a normal world, a lot of these guys have not been playing. They, they're they coming into what's sort of their preseason. And this is even something that Eric Ramsey said this week, that in, in normal circumstances, you would sort of slowly introduce them. You make sure they're up to fitness, but you got nine games. You got to make the playoffs. And so it's a little bit of, well, we want to be careful, but we also we need to win this week. We need to. That this is what Eric Ramsey's saying of saying we we got to get the points. Every game is important. We need a point. We need three points. So it's not going to be like well, Kelvin Yo will play him fifteen minutes, then thirty minutes, then maybe thirty five minutes, and only then we'll think about starting him. I think they're thinking their thought process is more like well, we need this guy to we need this guy as soon as possible. So I'm not saying he's going to start on Saturday. I don't know what their what their plan is, but I I do think that. The, I, I think you'll see more of the new guys quick, more quickly than you would have otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. Manny, where do we see these guys on the field in positions and how they play? How does this change how Minnesota United will, how we'll see them play coming up on Saturday? Yeah, obviously Pereira is still working on visa stuff, so he, yep. he won't be available. Uh, but in terms of Bo, he's been training for a couple of weeks now, and obviously he can play wider in the middle. So there's options for Eric, um, you know, going to the front three, or there's options for Eric with going with a with a two forward system. Um, certainly, the, the weeks off the leagues cup has gotten us healthy. It's given him a lot of options and opportunities. Um, and then Diaz, you know, is is you know, kind of your defender that I would expect him uh, to be able to make an impact right away as well. Um, so I, I think those two probably more than any are probably the ones that are going to get the most minutes on Saturday. Just my guess. Again, like uh, John said, I can't say for sure. But those are the two that I think um, will probably have the most impact in, in seeing where we are with the group. And it is a big game. You know, ultimately, the, the challenge here is to kind of take the good things we've done throughout the year, um, learn from the areas where we've had adversity and struggle, and now add these guys as a mix to hopefully have a cauldron to have a great nine-game run. Um, and there is some unknown, but ultimately this group needs to come together. And sometimes that that's not a bad thing. Sometimes, you know, right now this is, is – 
I want to say it's must win completely, but we've got to take care of our home games now and in, in this run in to to really push ourselves to to get a playoff spot and hopefully even up the playoff line a little bit. For sure. It'll be a fun stretch. We'll dive into that in a little bit on the show. I want to zoom out a little bit. Leagues Cup action last night, semifinals, uh, LAFC dominating Colorado in a 4-0 route. Columbus and Philadelphia, a 3-1 win for Columbus, setting up what is a rematch of the MLS Cup final from last year, Columbus hosting LAFC. John, thoughts on how Leagues Cup played out and uh, what are our expectations for this final? Well, finally, something different for soccer to see Columbus <laughs> in a final. I mean, what a what a novel thing League's Cup is bringing us to see Columbus and LAFC <laughs> playing in the final of a tournament. This is great. I mean, what what else could you ask for in terms of entertainment value, right there? <laughs> I get the sense you're you're not excited about seeing no, the two best I, clubs in the U.S. playing each other in the League's Cup final. It'll be fun, but it would be more fun if it was. You know, teams that really had something to play for, teams that haven't won a lot of trophies, <laughs> you know, something different rather than, oh, well, we're going to have these two teams will probably play for MLS Cup in, you know, three months or whatever. So yeah, Columbus right. was just in the in, in the CONCACAF Champions Cup final. And it's just, you know, it, it's more of the same. It it does speak to where Columbus is at because it wasn't that long ago in the grand scheme of things that Columbus's owner was trying to move them to Austin and everybody was ready to slap Anthony Precourt over the head with a two by four, just because he was trying to ruin one of the original franchise of the league. That was like what, six years ago, seven years ago, something like that. Wasn't that and long? now, now they make the final of every tournament. Wilfred Nazi is a God among coaches that cannot be approached by any other coach somehow. I don't know. I, I don't know how they're doing it. It's just amazing. Every player on their team is 55% better than they've been on any other team they've ever played in their life. I it's it's unreal to watch them. And it feels like they're three, four deep at every single position as well, yeah. Manny. Yeah, I I mean I I, I like John's comment in that uh <laughs> wh- where the cynicism is is correct is that LAFC and, and Columbus have just been dominant, you know, and I, I think the the compelling thing for me in the League's Cup is I would argue right now you probably throw Miami in there on, on on kind of the paper of the season with Messi. Those are the kind of the throp, three top teams in the league. This is an indictment of Mexico. Their th- three top teams in their league did not show up for this tournament that we were putting together to kind of highlight in them. They really want to be in this country and build their brand. Well, you got to win. And just Monterey, Tigres, and Club America, it, it, it just was – to to have them not even in the semifinals, one of those three is shocking to me. Um, and it, it's not about dominance of MLS, really. At the end of the day, uh, this is about those three big brands did not show up for this tournament. Club America had home field, essentially, the entire time. They had rest. Yes. They had an ability to at least get to the semifinals. So for me, the, the indictment is is more about how those three teams didn't show up than any other kind of MLS. And now this is LAFC versus Columbus, which are – Arguably the two best teams in the league. Again, maybe with Messi, Miami, we can have a fun debate over a beer about it. Uh, but those are the two best teams. And it, it showed last night. They dominated uh, their home games in the semifinals. I think that's the most shocking thing to me about this tournament, John, is that there was no Liga MX clubs in the semifinals. They, they were all out before that. That is, and it was all MLS, and it was an all MLS final again. I think that's the more surprising thing to me that it didn't seem like uh, the Mexican clubs were ready to go this time, this year. It You know, it's funny. It's, ever since they expanded the League's Cup last year, one of the open questions has been, well, how seriously is League MX going to take this, really? They're playing all the games on the road, blah, blah, blah. Y- you can say all of that, and you can wonder about that, but I guarantee you Club America doesn't like losing to Colorado in the quarterfinals. <laughs> you know what I mean? That that yeah. doesn't look – that doesn't look – that doesn't play well for Club America's fans to go down to – to go down to the Colorado Rapids who are, you know, the Colorado Rapids are who they are, but they not a name like club America and Monterey fired their coach. Didn't they, after they went out? Oh yeah. They fired their coach. Yep. Yeah. How many, how many other league MX teams fired their coach after this league's cup? I did. Ch- Chivas didn't fire their coach, right? They didn't. No, no, no. I no, still yeah. think Monterey was a little kind of a combination of how slow start in the league. It yeah. was only a couple games, but, and then the the embarrassment of the league's cup, but yep. it, it was, again, I, I think that's to me was the story of the tournament. And I think the story story was how many, how well a lot of the MLS teams did in the early rounds against league MX teams. Again, I think you can get away with, you know, saying, oh, they weren't it's early in their season. They're not maybe as fit. 
But once you get to these three big brands and, and their inability to get one of those three teams to the semifinal of this tournament, I have to flip it now and, and you know give so much credit to Columbus and LFC for getting to the final again. But this is on those brands. I mean, th mm -hmm. These are teams. Monterey has the most expensive roster in this hemisphere. Um, and so it, it's it's I think it's a little bit deeper than just not being fit for this tournament. Yeah, and there's there'll certainly be talking points down in Mexico about how uh, everything broke down for those clubs. Uh, another big news item since we last talked, it's now become mostly official, hasn't been officially announced, but pretty much everybody, every reporter on the planet has confirmed that Mauricio Pochettino is the new, will be the new U.S. men's national team head coach. John, we got we got Manny's thoughts two weeks ago when the news was just breaking as we were recording. So I want your thoughts on this. I think this is a huge hiring for me. I love this hiring. I think this is awesome. A great development for the U.S. men's national team. And I'm excited to see how he's able, to, what he's able to do with this roster. Yeah, you know, I think, I think this is really interesting, both for Pochettino, who is taking a job that I think a lot of people would have said, I, that's kind of beneath where Pochettino should be at. And I think it'll be interesting to see what a guy with his pedigree can do with the U S it's a little bit like for him taking a step back to, to, to his old days before he was a, a, a Galacticos coach and in, into his old days where he's, you know, coaching sort of a, a smaller team that he's got to get the most out of. And I, I think that'll be interesting. I think it'll be trouble when he does the Pochettino thing where he goes into that first meeting with Matt Crocker and sits down and lays out all the signings he wants to make. Cause I, I don't, I'm not sure he understands how that, that works. I guess we'll see. Um, but uh, I, I, I think that he's a big name, which is something that the U S needed right now. And it, it's different than even, you know, Greg Burhalter was a big name in American soccer when they hired Burhalter. But I, I think that moving forward and having someone who's sort of a, a big name, a little bit like Emma Hayes on the women's side, I think that's good for American soccer, especially as they move forward into the world cup where it, I think you can overplay how important the world cup is, but at the same time, because I'm so immersed in it all the time, I think I can underplay it a little bit too, because for me, of course, it's just, oh, it's another international tournament. It's not a big deal. But for the the people who don't spend day in and day out watching this stuff, it's a huge deal. It's an amazing deal. So having a big name coming in before the World Cup in 2026, I think was important to have a, a, a name brand, so to speak. What are our expectations for them now? I mean, we always had the expectation that they have to do well because the U.S. are hosting. But now with Pochettino in charge, Manny, does that up what you think the U.S. men's national team should be able to do at the upcoming World Cup? Um, yeah, I mean, it's honestly like I'm sitting here trying to talk about this and I, I want to like have kind of a measured good response. I inevitably become a fan and I get nervous again I'm, I'm like this weirdly cautiously optimistic because uh unlike emma hayes i know emma hayes is all in on the u.s u.s culture all i have a crush on her because of it she just loves you <laughs> we got her career started here she is a badass just like she's all in good bad ugly if she doesn't do well it, it's not because she's not all in on the belief in u.s soccer and i again i love the higher that we're kind of trying to think outside the box. I love trying to get somebody who's on paper, you know, such a high level clubs he's worked with. I just, then once it happened, now I'm kind of nervous again. And I'm nervous because, you know, I, I want him to be all in like Emma is. And I'm just not sure until we get there. And ultimately like, there's no going back now though. We, we have two years now to prepare for this run where Jonathan, yes, I expect on home turf with these players in their prime, to come together the group, even if they're not the world-class best players, to make a run in the World Cup. Um, and I, I expect, hopefully, that we hired the right leader and, and to, to get us there. And, again, it makes me nervous because a lot of things have to come together. Not only do the guys that are right now in two years have to be infinitely better collectively, individually, but then we have to have a coach that's all in and getting the most out of them individually and collectively. And so I, I'm just in this weird moment where we knew it was going to happen. We wanted the change. And then now it's here and I'm, I'm nervous again because ultimately uh, until we start seeing that what he does, you know, it, it's TBD for me. Sounds like you've kind of got that Minnesota sports fan apprehen <laughs> apprehensive nervousness. Damaged, excitement uh, damaged you, I guess. <laughs> hey, I mean, look at it this way. If 
the U.S. made it to the final of the World Cup and lost, that would be an amazing step forward for the U.S. men's national team. And who better to lead a team to a final and then lose than Mauricio Pochettino? <laughs> He's got so much experience doing that. Uh, Andy Greer is going to look at you, going to give you such mean side eye in the press box. On Andy Saturday. Greeter gives me mean side eyes no matter what I do. <laughs> There's nothing I can do to avoid it. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> Uh, speaking of Tottenham, Andy Greeter's club, let's talk about uh, the European club soccer soccer season starting this last weekend uh, in the Premier League. It opened up, I believe, in Serie A. It opened up as well uh, in Liga in France and La Liga in Spain. They all opened up. Guys, what leagues excite you uh, the most? John, we'll start with you then, Manny, after what, afterwards. What leagues or clubs excite you the most in Europe? Uh, you know, every year I get excited for the Premier League to come back and then they start in and Manchester City wins their first game. It's like, ah, dang it. I forgot about this. <laughs> I, you, you look, you look sort of down the table and it's like, oh yeah, the, this team could be good. And oh, this team could be, oh, this could be their year. And then Manchester City plays one game. And you're like, this league is the same every year. Why do I, what am I, what am I getting into this for? Now this will be a Bundesliga year. Maybe, maybe I'll be a Bundesliga guy. Somebody You'll different find finally Bundesliga won the Bundesliga. Team? That's right. <laughs> they're, they're not never accusing anymore. So maybe we can all be Bayer Leverkusen people for a year. Just, uh, just for something different. Okay. I, I get the sense that you don't like the same teams winning every year from your league's cup well, take to now this. It just, I, I still, I, I still get frustrated. I can't remember what year this was. This is probably going back a year or two, but there was right on the first day of the premier league season, they were hyping it up. And I think there was one somewhat surprising result on the first day. And one of the commentators said, man, you'll never find a league more unpredictable than the premier league. What are you talking about? The same team wins the premier league every year. The same four or five teams are in the top four every single season. This is not unpredictable. I could predict the, I could predict the result of seven out of 10 premier league games before they start every single week. Don't tell me this is an unpredictable league. You want an unpredictable league? Come to America. Come to MLS. LAFC is going to play San Jose and lose 7-1 to one or something like that. <laughs> you want to predict that? That's not going to happen in the Premier League. You want chaos. What you want is chaos, and that's what we got over here. I got to give our bookers credit. This is an incredible, incredible <laughs> guess. John, John you come with the energy <laughs> that we I needed like after it. two weeks off. <laughs> hey, I like it, too. I mean, I, again, I, I tell people all along, we, we sometimes don't lean into the value of the parity. Yeah. of our league and the the journey of growth of the rosters is getting deeper and deeper and that i did kind of allude to that in the league's cup the, the middle mls teams and the middle mexican teams is a really big indicator that our league is growing and it is getting stronger from top to bottom in a way that yes messi is the greatest player of all time he's getting a lot of the 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 bandwidth uh, Giroud signing lafc but really there are a lot of clubs and a lot of growth happening in MLS, which it, it's almost like a golf game where you're going from like a 90 to an, an 88 or 85 or whatever. Like you probably don't really see it until you kind of have to see it in these moments where, where John's just alluding to with the Premier League. So on the MLS thing, I, I do think it is the coolest league in the world from parity. I do think it's the coolest league to have a fan base with changes from one year to the next can be making the top four or maybe making a run in the MLS Cup playoffs. So uh, I'm, I'm with John all in on that. In terms of Europe, I think my three biggest leagues are probably, if I look at Germany, I'm, I'm intrigued by what, if Bayern can bounce back and if Harry Kane experiment is going to work or not. Um, I'm obviously the Leverkusen story and Alonso is just so fun to watch. So I think if anybody, you know, hadn't followed last year, that run that they had was one of the most amazing runs I've seen in sports history. Uh, so I think those two things, storylines for me, um, Madrid, uh, I think the woe is me, Barcelona, everybody should play for us. You don't have money and they're financially <laughs> in ruins, is a real thing where like, can they get these young kids to compete? We'll see. Uh, and then just the, the Galacticos are back now. Madrid has Mbappe Jr. Um, and they're, they're going to be interesting because can they all play together? Is it the right balance? And after game one, Ancelotti already talked about balance, you know, which is fascinating when they have all these superstars. So I'm I'm just intrigued about that. You know, ultimately in the end, I think they'll figure it out because Real Madrid always figures it out. Uh, but I do think there's a storyline there to say, like, how does Madrid figure out to make themselves the best team in Europe again? Uh, and then going into England, I, I think that top three is impressive. I, I, I sneakily do think 
Arsenal and Liverpool are ready to compete and and take the mantle. I, I think this is their year. I think they are going to week in and week out be a little bit more tough and resilient than Man City personally. So I think there's some at the top end of this. I think there's be some drama in Europe. Yeah, in England. Excited. Yeah, in England. Yeah, yeah. I'm always excited for Premier League to come back. Uh, kind of watch on the periphery, listen to a bunch of podcasts about the other leagues as well, and watch when those teams get into Champions League. Uh, are we willing to say the teams that we support in Europe? Are we willing to go that far, or you want to hold those close to the chest, guys? I can tell already that Manny is a huge Barcelona supporter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, just honest. The, I'm just the honest. dry, the drive-by stabbing of just <laughs> going by Barcelona and being like, "Oh yeah, these guys fart noise." Um, yeah, I do have some Spanish Madrid blood in me, so there might have been something more to that. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, it is fascinating to see such a global brand, and and just for them to struggle to figure out how to like get out of their financial problems and build a roster that's worthy of those early 2000s Barcelona teams. It's, it's really fascinating. And, it, and it's a reminder. It's very similar to Manchester United right now. Like this sport is not easy. It is not easy to find the balance, both to build a roster, build a competitive roster, build a financial model that you can sustain it over decades. Um, it's, it's very, very hard. Um, and, you know, Manchester United and Barcelona are two brands right now that have really struggled uh, since they've, they've kind of lost to well, Messi Barcelona's case, and then they mentioned United, you know, one of the greatest coaches of all time, Sir Alex Ferguson. So, um, it, it's not an easy business, which is why we love it. Yeah, Bar- I, I will say, Barcelona, for those, it's the most amazing story for me because it wasn't that long. We all remember when Barcelona was giving away the sponsorship on their jerseys because they had so much money. They didn't even have to worry about it. And now they have so little money, they've been reduced to trying to bully guys that are on their team to make them cry and then leave so that they have enough money to sign another player. It's just, they, they've they gone from being the most amazing brand in the world to eighth grade lunch table stuff. It's amazing. It's utterly, the, 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 the downward spiral they've been in, amazing to watch. I say this is not a Barcelona, I'm not a Barcelona hater, I'm not a Barcelona fan, but it just from outside watching the chaos, always fun. Oh yeah, chaos is always enjoyable to watch, whether you're yep. in it or you're outside of it. It's... I'm coming down very solidly on the side of chaos right now. Oh, absolutely, like I'm with you. I'm with like you. Chaos. Now, again, I, one of the cool things about this sport is it can also be solved by them developing unbelievable talent that is of value in the global market <laughs> and helps them win and get back to their winning ways. There's no doubt that's kind of what their model has to be. But it's it's hard when you're watching Real Madrid sign Mbappe, uh, and now they have to figure out how to beat them. <laughs> That, I mean, that's the other amazing thing. Barcelona has the best known academy in the whole world. Absolutely. The one that if you know any soccer academy, you know the name of Barcelona's academy. And yet they're still in this mess. It's amazing. It is really incredible. Anytime you see a transfer rumor come out and it says Barcelona is looking to sign a player and you just kind of think, <laughs> with what money? Like, where, yeah. where, where is this coming from? Who are you? Who's being sold? Because there's been very little rumors about who's being sold. And there's always rumors about them trying to buy a guy. And it's like, where are you getting this money from? I'm yeah. always confused when I see that over the past couple of years, but it is their, their fall. And unfortunately my club, Manchester United's fall has been incredible to watch and see how they've gotten into those situations. And hopefully uh, from a fan perspective, Manchester United are finally on the upswing and getting out of that, but we will, we shall see. Just because the Loons are away doesn't mean you have to watch the match from home. With Loons Watch Spots presented by Coors Light, you can find a piece of that Allianz Field atmosphere at some of your favorite Twin Cities locations. Check out the full list of locations and upcoming watch parties at mnufc.com slash Loons Watch Spots. Let's jump into Minnesota United coming up this weekend, uh, playing Seattle, hosting Seattle. Looking forward to this one, guys. Uh, Seattle eliminated 3-0 by LAFC in the League's Cup quarterfinals. They had a run. Uh, They've been in a good bit of form heading into the League's Cup. They've really turned things around and become really a force once again in the Western Conference. What are our expectations and what are our thoughts of playing Seattle, a team that Minnesota United, since joining the MLS, has only beat once 
in a number of games. It's always been a a bogey team for Minnesota United, Manny. Um, I, I mean, I start with it, it is. I, I I'm I'm way too over the top, but it's it's true. I'm right. It is such a special <laughs> game for Minnesota soccer um, because it's a national TV game. It's against a team and a club that we haven't had great success and we need to win. Uh, beautiful night. I think it's going to be our biggest crowd of the year because just partly because people love Allianz Field and watching us play there. and We haven't been there for a long time and they're just clamoring to go. So it's going to be everything is set up for us in a must win game. You know, it really is to start this run of nine games. We've got to take care of our home game. So um, just from that, everything lines up where we got to make it a special night. So I, I think it just starts with that kind of mentality. I think the fans are going to show up nervous, but excited. And I think our players, we need to take that and, and, and find a way to walk off the field with three points ultimately and find a way to, to, to kind of get going uh, for this run at the final nine games. Yeah. John. You know, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to give all my ideas away for free here, but I'm going to give this one away for free. This is for you, Manny, anybody else in Minnesota. I'm United. Excited. The this, secret this for Saturday, wear LAFC's jerseys. That's the best <laughs> possible way to beat Seattle. Any other team, Seattle's amazing. They play LFC. They're terrible. They lose three to nothing every time. Put on LAFC jerseys. It's going to be the, the, the best possible mental block. It'll be like the Mighty Ducks. Which, uh, which Mighty Ducks movie was it where they came out with the different jerseys in the third period? Well, we kind of have similar logos. They kind of took elements of our logo. So maybe yeah, we exactly. No. Yeah, exactly. Just, you, wear, you know. If you it, wear the blanket, has, you, sh- you should be fine, right? Yeah. <laughs> it has By nothing way, to do with Bogush and Buanga and all those guys. Nothing to do yeah. with that. It's all the jerseys. I can't believe I'm giving this stuff away for free. Well, no, I'll give one away for free for everybody here. Do you guys know right. I just brought up the logo thing? Uh, you know that LAFC came after us in the MLS, and the designer of that logo went to my high school, St. Paul Academy. So when I say really? there's similar elements to these logos, I truly believe that <laughs> our Minis- local Minnesotan that designed the LAFC logo, you know, had a chance to look at ours first and really like the Loon logo. So can we say that guy's like. name? Can we can we actively slander that guy in this podcast? <laughs> oh, no, you can look just, him can up. Name him? All right. Pretty- actually so he's, he's done a lot of work in national teams around the world so but yeah i won't say his name <laughs> you can find it very quickly if you really wanted to, to look into that a little bit more that info just like john's info on how to beat seattle is available for free on the internet as well so you That's can right. go look that up as well uh yeah this this is a really interesting game because of the run of form as john kind of alluded to seattle's woes against lafc minnesota has the similar woes against seattle and it's really interesting because minnesota for me uh, interesting that they've been off for, it feels like a month at this point, it's almost been a month, Manny, what's, what's the task? <laughs> how do you, how do you get a team back into form after being off for a month, not having a competitive game for a month? And you go right into the final stretch of the season where every single point is going to matter towards your playoff lives. Yeah. I think you start with the fact that you, you look at the time off as a glass half full where we've gotten healthier, we've gotten fitter. The group has trained on some ability to to work on, you know, two weeks of really hard training tactically, physically. Um, so we, we've got a group of players now, whether they're starting or coming off the bench, that should be ready to fight and scrape for these three points this weekend and really kind of contribute however we can. So I, I think that is one of the biggest positives. We should be very well prepared to play against Seattle, both from how we want to play, but also tactically how we want to deal with Seattle and, and um it's one of those ones where because the time's off a little bit, it, it it does make you nervous. But because of the urgency of this game, I, I think we should just be ready to go. And, um, you know, ultimately, um, I think at times we've done well against Jordan Morris. Uh, I think he's somebody that, you know, we have to be aware of. Uh, Paul Rothrock has really <laughs> come onto the scene and, and reminds me of like a kind of journeyman American player that has found his way based on his work rate, his work ethic, and it's kind of, lined up well with Seattle needing those type of players right now. So again, for me, it's, it's a big one. I I think the balance of us integrating new guys, making sure we're not giving up any early goals, but then also playing loose enough to get forward and create chances is going to get the job done. What is it that Brian Schmetzer has been doing that has allowed Paul Rothrock, Jordan Morris, Obed Vargas to have these seasons that they've been having this year? Um, I think the adversity of of the group. I think I, I think there's obviously um, 
you know, he, he has kind of tried to get Rudy Diaz out and it hasn't quite worked, but then it just in, in terms of doing that, he's kind of allowed younger guys to play and, and different guys in different lineups. So I, I think De La Vega too has struggled and an injury struggle. So at first he's like, okay, he's getting healthy and he's back. He's our guy. But then eventually like, oh my gosh, this guy's so injury prone. And so I think they've kind of maybe even given up on him being an impact player. And then that leads some of the expense to be like, well, what do I do? I can't go out and spend another couple million dollars on a player. So you start looking at your roster a little more internally and saying, oh, I've got something here. I've got to get more out of this, this kid, Paul Rothrock, because I thought Vega was going to be that guy, and he's not. So I think there's just some natural things that Schmetzer has done really well throughout his career within seasons that we have to give him credit for. Um, and ultimately, we, we've, we've been down this road many years with Seattle starting slow and always building the group that tends to be competitive by the end of the year. And that's a lot of credit to him of, of many, many years of, of just honing in how to improve a team over a year. Don, do we expect any kind of tactical wrinkles or anything different from Eric Ramsey coming up Saturday now that he's had essentially a little bit of a training camp that he didn't get when he first started? Well, you know, I think it's a little bit interesting because when you look at how Minnesota plays, I think it's certainly easy to look at how they defend and say, well, they always just play a back five and they play two or three guys in midfield and two or three guys up front. But if you ask Eric Ramsey about what they're doing, he's absolutely insistent that it's a lot more complicated than that. They're doing a lot more wrinkles. And I think you can see that when you look at their offensive build outs and which guys they're putting where they'll have guys who are defending his wing backs and then playing his wingers offensively and stuff. So I think all that's interesting. That said, given the number of new guys they've brought in, I don't think they're going to suddenly flip the script and do something a heck of a lot different just because keeping things somewhat the same while you're trying to integrate new guys seems like a good idea to me. But I say that I didn't expect him to switch to a back five 15 weeks ago or whatever. And here we are talking about it as if it's set in stone. So I don't know. I also do want to say Manny was saying that Brian Schmetzer was trying to get Rui Diaz out of the club. Is it possible? I don't want to, you know, I don't want to start rumors. I got to be honest. I don't know that for sure. It just seems like they were, he's gotten less and less playing time. So yeah, I'm just saying you make it some connections here. Hassani Dotson's, from out there, could he be a sleeper agent? We, you know, coming in with a tackle that was about at thigh high level, to taking Rui Diaz out in the last game. Could he be a Brian Schmetzer sleeper agent? I don't, you know, again, I don't want to give away this. ideas for free here. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to say this is true. In fact, it's not true, but I do want to <laughs> say it's, it's, you know, you, you start connecting the things. I'm, I'm like that meme with all the things that, you know, beautiful mind right here. Just it's all happening. chaos right now. Agents yeah. of chaos. No, I, I, I do think you bring up a point about the back three versus back five. And, and that's, that's where I don't know how the game's going to play out. Um, particularly when you have breaks, but obviously, you know, for defending deep, it'll be more like a back five and it'll be more of a counterattack setup. If we can get numbers four and have the ball it'll be more like a back three, when we get numbers naturally for that. Those, those would be some interesting tactical twists that we have to see as the game plays out. Uh, and ultimately, again, I, I think we want to be on the front foot, but again, when you put yourself in a situation where you, don't want or you can't lose or must win, you do have to make sure defensively that you don't give up soft goals in these moments. Again, we are getting to the moments where your, your group is almost getting to like playoff type games during the regular season. And it hopefully can allow you to, to push your, your intensity and, and your model. But there are times when you get a little frozen, a little bit tentative and a little bit uh, not wanting to make a mistake. And so that awesome balance of finding a way to play free and flowing while still being tough defensively, is it's going to be a big task for the group this weekend. One thing I didn't bring up earlier when we were talking about the new signings is that there, it has been a busy window and there's been a lot of new faces. Manny, what's what? How difficult is it to integrate all these new faces in the middle of a season without disrupting anything that you've already built on over the past uh, what twenty or so weeks it's been? Um. All right, I'm going to try to be as clever as John, which I won't be, but this will be for free. Um, okay. We have staffs that get paid to do that and yeah. make sure that works. <laughs> that yeah. is a huge part of, of our staff's job is to really, you know, take those adversity, take those groups, build, you know, individual and collective unity and, and make sure it comes out in the field as a group that's that's fighting for each other the right way and, and you know, heading in the right direction. So ultimately, my answer would be I, I – I think it's difficult, but it would be similarly difficult for, let's just say something like LAFC right now that probably has 
16 to 17 starters deep and their head coach has to manage those players to make sure they're all hungry and ready to go and understand their roles and what they're doing. And they didn't make that many changes or they made the one change and Drew's coming in. And he's got to make sure he still has the same flow that he had, by the way, since they lost to us uh, <laughs> back in the day. And that was their last game where I was like, they did not look that good. And they've looked really good every game since. So you're saying you're welcome LAFC for kickstarting yeah. your season. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Eric yeah. Ramsey poked the bear. <laughs> you don't but want it, to poke it, the bear. It's going to be hard. And, and again, we have to absorb, like, like in real time, he's got to absorb the realities of how the guys are doing, how they're integrating, how we're going to manage the game tactically and, and week by week in these micro cycles, obviously Seattle, then boom, we go to, we go to San Jose, which obviously they haven't done that well, but they had a nice leagues cup run. I think they gained a little bit of confidence. So, um, and then we have another break, by the way. So again, sometimes you want these games and now we'll break and we'll go to St. Louis, which, you know, has, as another team like San Jose hasn't done that well, but has seemed to kind of uptick lately and that'll be a tough game away. So uh, it's, it's a big month uh, for us to, to kind of come out of the league's cup disappointment and make sure that we're building a group that makes the playoffs. So let's put you guys on the spot. What are your expectations for the end of the season for this nine nine match stretch into the to the end of the season. John, we'll start with you. Manny, we'll give you a little bit of time. Your expectations for Minnesota United over these final nine games. Well, you know, I, I think I said this this week. I think they'll make the playoffs. I, I do think that they are a good enough team and have added enough talent and have enough to stay above that playoff line. We, even, I think, I think a reasonable expectation is to get out of the wild card game and get above the 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 actual playoff line into seventh or higher. I think I think that's a reasonable expectation for the team. But at, at the same time, you, you sort of look at the top of the conference. They're not catching LAFC. They're not catching the Galaxy. There's uh, getting a home a, a home playoff. The home field advantage in the playoff seems too far for me. So my expectation is that they'll end somewhere in that sort of five, six, seven, maybe even the wild card range. Manny. I, it, it's a, it's a challenging question, Jonathan, for, yeah. I, I think definitely, you know, we're in that playoff realm and I'm excited to see where the group grows and, and, and deals with the adversity again, uh, this game, this weekend, Cincinnati at home, uh, the two games on the road trip, when we go to RSL and Vancouver, th those are all the key moments. Those are all the moments where, uh, this team is going to be looking in good shape if we can handle the adversity of those games. Cause I think the other games uh, will only add to our feeling confident and then handling teams maybe that we're expected to beat as well. Yeah. I, I think I'm, I think I'm right with you guys. I think this is definitely a playoff team. I think I'm more aligned with John here in that I believe this is a team that should be able to get into uh, above the real playoff line outside of that wild card spot and should be able to contend. I mean, you look at where they go, where they're standing right now, heading into this final stretch of games, sitting on 33 points, just four points out of that seventh place spot. You've got teams, uh, you got Seattle, Houston, Vancouver, and Colorado uh, on from 41 to 37 points. I think that's doable to get into that range of teams to fight in that spot in the playoffs. And I think that that should be a reasonable expect expectation for this club, considering all the work that went on in the in this last transfer window. They've had a couple weeks off now. I know some can look at that negatively. Some can look at it positively as well. And it's given them time to get healthy, as Manny, you've pointed out, that that was desperately needed after playing a an incredible amount of games in a short amount of time heading into that Leagues Cup break. This is a team that should be healthy and ready to go and refreshed and rejuvenated. And I'm excited to see it come out on on Saturday at Allianz Field, 5.30 p.m. Uh, on MLS Season Pass, Minnesota United. That's the pre-match show uh, on MLS Season Pass. So that's when the broadcast starts. The actual kickoff itself is 5.55 p.m. at Allianz Field. Uh, Dan Terrar and myself will be starting our broadcast on 1500 ESPN at 5 p.m. We'll have a 55-minute buildup. Manny, I'm sure you'll be a part of that as well. Hey, as, hey Jonathan. As always. Yeah. Uh, is it taboo or isn't this game on national TV as well? Fox? It is. Yes. Yes. On Fox as well. And MLS season pass. All of them. a pretty special one for the group as well. So just yeah, for sure. National television for that one. Let's get into, let's end the show here with some ex expectations for the rest of major league soccer. As we head down this final stretch of games, you look at the Western conference, LA galaxy uh, head in headed into the league's cup break in first place in the Western Conference on 49 points. We know what they've done in the transfer window, bringing in uh, Marco Royce. Uh, LAFC on 47, Rail Salt Lake in 44. Do we imagine that is 
Those are the three teams that will sit at the top of the Western Conference when the season ends in October, John. Yeah, you know, I think what the Western Conference feels like to me is there's LAFC, like you say, not in first place, but they're the team to beat in the West. And then right below them, you have LA, the Galaxy, and RSL that are contenders. And then everybody else is sort of depending on whether they catch fire at the right time. But I, I wouldn't be surprised to see any of those three teams come out of it. I do think that LAFC is the team that everybody is looking at and going, if you want to, if you're going to make it somewhere, you got to beat LAFC. That's all there is to it. So I, it feels like sort of the one, then a group of two, then a group of a lot of others of, you know, you're never going to bid against Seattle in the playoffs. You're never, Portland has caught fire at various times this year. You know, we, we already talked about Minnesota. Houston is, competent this year which is always kind of a surprise to me when they're competent um but it's sort of that group of top three at the west in the western conference it feels like that actually has something going for it right now is there a team that's currently outside of the playoffs in the western conference that you expect to put up a fight and be in the playoffs by the by the time the season ends manny those teams Uh, below the playoff line right now austin dallas kansas city st louis and san jose I mean, obviously, I think Kansas City and St. Louis are really, really in a hole that I think would be an amazing run to, to catch up with. Yeah. Um, I, 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 you know, my brain is so Minnesotan, I don't think so, because they'd have to pass us, which I don't think they're going to do. I think we're going to figure this out. We're going to make a good run. So on the other end, I, I'm a little bit more with John. I'm like, I think it's LAFC. And then after that, I'm not sure where it goes. You know, I remember ourselves sold arguably their best player this year for $10 million. And that can affect their run. You know, ultimately, I know they're they've made some pretty good signings for replacements, but I, I I'm trying to think about what that does to this run for them because he was so good. Um, the Galaxy have been up and down defensively, but certainly one of the more fun teams to watch in the league. So it's fascinating when it to me after LAFC as well. I I think after that, I'm like I think it is a little bit more wide open than people realize. In the Eastern Conference, I know we don't talk about it too much on the show. Uh, but the Eastern Conference, Miami in first on 53 points, Cincinnati 48, Columbus 43. Uh, same question as the Western Conference. Is that, are those? Well, the I, I have a question for John. He's the journalist yeah. on the show. When is Messi going to be back? Uh, <laughs> tomorrow. I've been talking to my sources and he's coming back tomorrow. He's got, uh, he's had a bionic leg implanted. So he should that's be what he go. needed is to be put to me made even better. It's. We, we, we can't talk about it, though. That's the important thing we have to remember. We're not allowed to talk about the bionic leg, but it's happening. Uh, that's fair. Uh, Miami, Cincinnati, Columbus. Those are the three teams, or do we expect uh, New York, one of the New York teams, to make a run at it in the East, Manny? Um, I, 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 I'm intrigued. Cincinnati has dropped their level, but, again, it, uh, the, the messy question was pertinent because I don't know if, if Miami sustains this without him yeah. coming back. Um, and then can Cincinnati kind of turn around and start playing a little more consistent? Um, Columbus is probably a little bit too far behind to catch uh, Miami at 10. I think they're 10 points behind, which I think is a little bit too much of a, bit of a gap. But I look at that top four being the top four uh, going to the playoffs. John? Red Bulls, Columbus, Cincy, yeah. Miami. Yeah, I, I mean, I was joking about Columbus before, but they're fascinating in the sense that they're in third place. I don't know if they'll catch Cincinnati or Miami at the top there, but I'm not betting against Columbus come playoff time. There's they're like they're not they're not going to be the number one seed in the playoffs, but they're kind of the number one seed in the playoffs. You know what I mean? Like nobody beats Columbus come come playoff time. So it that sort of group of three, I think, is fascinating. And the fact that, you know, two of them are Cincinnati and Columbus, which obviously is uh, a, a, an interstate war is is even more interesting. I know three years ago, it feels like we were all expecting Columbus and Cincinnati to be the best teams in the Eastern conference. And now that's what we all said about Cincinnati (laughs) as they were the worst team in the history of American soccer for three. There was, there was a time I don't want to take this and criticize the Timberwolves, but there was a time where FC Cincinnati was the only team in all of men's professional sports that was, had the worst overall record than the Timberwolves. And you know, now the Timberwolves are better, but it was like, you put 155 teams together and then there was a drop off and there was the Timberwolves and then there was a clip and then it was FC Cincinnati. And it was just, and in terms of like winning percentage, it was just the two most disastrous franchises in the history of the world. And now Cincinnati is unbeatable. 
and the Wolves are unbeatable. Yeah. Thank you. The Wolves, what the, the, Wolves. the Wolves are unbeatable coming into this year. They're getting the Christmas game. They're getting opening day love. They're all getting, these, where? all these national TV games, which I was really excited about, and then someone reminded me that they'll all start at like nine thirty p.m. even if they're in oh. Minnesota, and then I was immediately furious about it. You know, one of the last themes I just wanted to bring up today, guys, was you know we 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 talked about uh, Europe. We talked about the great soccer. I love it. I loved opening day. It's exciting. I, I will say as a fan, uh, the way LAFC and Columbus are playing and they have this Leafs Cup final on Sunday night, you know, I would encourage anybody who is excited and proud of where MLS has come, the quality of play on the field between these two teams right now. Um, I want every kid in America to watch. I want them to see that you don't even have to get up on Saturday mornings all the time to watch great soccer. And again, that's some higher level, but it's grown. And just watching these two teams um, deservedly be in this final, it's exciting. And, and I think it's going to be an exciting matchup because both play differently. Both have kind of up and coming or, or in form, like 27 year old stars. Both have some aging veterans that are really good. And one has our, our Christian Ramirez on the field. And uh, I, I, did you guys see the assist he had? Ooh, yeah, <laughs> that was incredible. Where did that come from? And I'll, I'll honestly, I, I watched it again. I couldn't believe Taylor Twelman was just talking about Diego Rossi not getting touches. Like, I was like, how are you not mentioning this pass? You know, like this was we actually in Minnesota know that Christian has these moments in his wheelhouse, but uh, it was unbelievable. So again, it, it's got a little local flavor of the game as well, but also the level of these two teams right now is through the roof. Manny transitioning us perfectly into the closing segment of the show where we predict scores and predict uh, predict games. And that was the first game I was going to start off with was that League's Cup final coming up Sunday night. Columbus hosting LAFC, as we said at the top of the show, a rematch of the MLS Cup final. And it feels like a rematch or a, pre uh, a preview of the upcoming MLS Cup final with how these two teams have been playing of late. Uh, Manny, we'll start with you. Who's winning this game? I've got LAFC 2-1. Ooh, John. Uh two two draw in a penalty shootout, and I'm not going to try to predict who wins the penalty shootout. We... Uh, John, you know, it, reminder, it, there's extra time now. Those there is extra time. Good. Still. Uh, okay. Maybe Just I'll predict chaos. Sure. Two Just two at the end to process that. Two two at the end of 90 minutes. 4-4 four, four at the end at the end of no, I'm just kidding. I love it. Uh, Germany, <laughs> France, 1982. Yep. This is gonna be an incredible game if that's how it breaks out, John. I think I'm going Columbus here at home getting the win. I don't know the scoreline. I'll just throw something out. 3-1 Columbus. I think I'm going with that. Uh, it's going to be an exciting game nonetheless. Uh, other games coming up in MLS this weekend. Let's do Miami, Cincinnati. We have no idea whether Messi's playing or not, and that adds to the intrigue of making this pick. John, uh, you'll start. we'll start with you on this one. Miami hosting Cincinnati uh, coming up Saturday night. Uh, I think Miami wins 3-0, and you've never heard of any of the three guys that score for Miami. It's just that <laughs> kind of season for them. It's like, e even Miami guys are like, I, that guy hasn't even played for the second team yet. What is happening here? And that somehow that'll be the guys that get the goals. 2-2. <laughs> draw. 2-2? Two -two? Yeah. I think I'm going to Miami win. I'm going 1-0 Miami win. I don't know whether Messi's playing or not, but uh, going a Miami win. Final game of the day, Real Salt Lake. San Jose is the final game we'll pick here. Uh, Real Salt Lake hosting this one. San Jose, as you said, Manny, got some, built a little confidence in League's Cup, made, had some impressive performances. RSL, they did sell one of their best players in the transfer window. So some questions going into this one, uh, very different spots on the, on the table right now, but uh, some questions uh, on how these two teams will come out and restart their season. Manny, you're, you'll start here, Real Salt Lake hosting. I think Russell has been really good at home. I, I I can't see San Jose getting there. I mean, I would, it would be really good upset overall for everybody, but um, probably RSL, you know, three, one ish. All right, John. I think San Jose is back Two nothing San Jose. There we go. Chaos. Here it comes. Chaos. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'll go rail Salt Lake here. I think this is just, I think rail Salt Lake will just prove to people uh, as they've done all season that there, there should be no question of why you are there should be no doubt for what they are able to do despite selling one of their better performers this season. Uh, Real Salt Lake will put this home easily. 3-0 win for Real Salt Lake. Uh, boys, that's been a fun show. Uh, John brought the chaos and energy. Manny, you brought the insight. Looking forward to another great uh, game coming up Saturday. MLS is finally back for Minnesota United. Coming up Saturday, 5.30 pre-match show on 
Fox and MLS season pass, 5 p.m. pre-match show with Dan Terra and myself on 1500 ESPN, 555 p.m. kickoff. Remember, Lunes fans, a little bit later of a kickoff uh, than is posted out there, 555 p.m. kickoff for that one coming up at Allianz Field. Boys, we'll see you at Allianz Field on Saturday. Cheers. Sounds thanks. good. Can't wait, to come back to the, can't wait to come back to the podcast next year when my suspension's up again. <laughs> I'm looking forward to next spring. I'm It'll not dishing out a red card for this performance. <laughs> I love the chaos. Bring it back. Uh, Loons fans, thanks for sticking around and, and tuning back in. We'll talk to you next week.